Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video, and today's car is very special. The Ferrari 288 GTO. Actually, when it was launched, it was known purely as the Ferrari GTO, and it arrived at the Geneva Motor Show in 1984, and it set the seal for the turbocharged era of Ferrari, and quickly followed by the F40 there. An amazing car. It's Group B is the sort of the background to it. They felt they needed a, a Group B car, a competition car based on a road car. And it's this new turbocharged V8 engine was the sort of stepping stone before we got to the F40. All appeared in the 288 GTO. And what I've always loved about this car, it's more road biased than perhaps the F40 was. Now, a little bit of background. I was looking to buy a very special car in about 2005, 2006. I had a Ferrari 550 at the time, and I thought a 288 GTO might be the car for me. Uh, I couldn't decide between that and the Ferrari F40. I went to have a look at a Ferrari F40 first. I was not sure about it. I couldn't get over the construction of it. It's a, oh, obviously a hugely exciting car at the time, but the 288 GTO, I just thought, oh, perhaps that would be more roadable. I then was discussing this with the importer of Pagani in the UK. And he says, well, we're selling off our Zonda. Um, why don't you come and look at that? I, get, I took the Zonda for a road test. I thought, I'm just going to buy this. It was a little bit more than F40 and 288 at the time. I was about 220. Believe it or not, the F40 was around 170, 80. And one of these was available at 160,000 back then. Why didn't we just buy all of them at the time? But there you go. So this car, I never actually drove then, and it's always been in the back of my mind, is this the car I really should have owned instead of the Zonda? I'll reveal it all when we get back uh, to the end of the video. But now, I was discussing this story with the owner of that wonderful Chiron we borrowed last year, and he says, you must borrow my 288. And I, it was just an offer I couldn't resist. Uh, the car was actually in Paris. Charlie, who's behind the camera, had the uh, duty of bringing it over to the UK and had just the drive of his life bringing this back to the UK. And I've lived with it for a couple of weeks now. and We've done well over a thousand kilometers in it. A very special car. Let's go and have a closer look. Now, very obviously, this car was based on the Ferrari 308. So 1984, it had the quattro valve engine, but it didn't look like this. I love the job Pininfarina did on this, just pumping it, giving it all this muscle. And yet, you know, the front, this is sort of the same architecture here, but look how wide the arches are. It's a mix of ke early Kevlar, early sort of carbon fiber, fiberglass, aluminium, as far as I can see on the doors and the roof. I've seen people describe it as steel, but I put a magnet around it. There is nothing magnetic on this car. The highly distinctive mirrors just up on stalks, but I suppose at the front, it's that deep air dam and these added lights here. And these lights, this is the headlight and your flashing lights. If you're trying to get someone out of the way on the motorway, instead of waiting for these to pop up, you just flash here when you just pull on the stalk, but it gives it incredible muscle right from the off when you first see this car. If you come around the side, it gets even better. You've got the split rim, wheels on it, the Speedline wheels, wider, eight by 16 at the front, 10 inch at the rear by 16, and these Speedline split wheels, as you see. The other thing, because it, Group B was part rally and um, race, it sits higher. It's normal road sort of car height. It's not as extreme as the F40. This is definitely developed to road use. There was an evolution version of this, which was a race car, um, track orientated. There was a handful of them made before the F40 arrived. But on here, if you come round, the door is standard 308, as is the roof, apart from being aluminium, and then the big wide Kevlar arches at the back here. And you can see how they're just bolted onto the sill. You can see this hole here, this air intake here, sort of disguised into the sill you don't quite notice to begin with. And then, being a GTO, the three strakes, characteristic strakes, venting that rear arch. The other big difference between the 288 GTO and a regular 308 was it grew in wheelbase by 200 mil. And they needed to do that because of the engine being placed longitudinal and the gearbox out the back. They needed more space to fit it all in. And it also benefits the handling, the slightly longer wheelbase. 
Also here, you've got an oil uh, filler. This is, it's a dry sumped engine. That's the filler this side for the oil. On the, on the other side is where you put the fuel in. And then also at the back, you've got this cam tail, this kicked up rear, because this car is a 189 mile an hour car. You have the deep air dam on the front and this kick tail here for the aero at high speed. I think it's here when you see this is not a regular 308 and it's the way the gearbox is all on show there. 308, as I'm sure you're aware, transverse engine and gearbox, not so for the 208 GTO. They wanted it to put the V8 longitudinal, so they had twin turbos and that was the only way of doing it. They didn't want the turbo up against the bulkhead. We'll have a look at the engine in, the, in a moment. And they also, because there was this sort of racing um, sort of intent with this car, they could want the gearbox here so they could change the gear ratios should they wish to on rally or sprint. I love the quad exhaust on it and the way they moved the number plate down and you had this just simple rear Ferrari is so good to it and as I say GTO there's no 288 badging on this car at all it's just GTO let's have a look at the engine two D fasteners either side you undo first and then it lifts up the wrong way as it were and there's a little strut here and you just prop it up now shock on this when I first looked at it there's a V8 engine but it stops there look how much they've shoved it into the cabin how they try to make this as mid-engine as possible almost into the center line of the car and also the sm smaller intercoolers and the different air intakes that is compared to the F40 the F40 has this spider web on top not so on this this has a simpler intake here and then it's just like a sort of diagram of how to, to do turbocharged cars so so it manifold this side feeding one turbo and then another one on the other side so that's the twin turbo idea of it this is the wastegate here exhaust gearbox and this was all done by an incredible engineer who gained the reputation as being a bit of a turbo master in the 70s his name was Nicola Materazzi He's a real hero engineer of mine. He came renowned at Lancia because he, he did 1,600 HFs or oversaw that. He then moved on to Lancia Stratos and then there was an evolution of the Stratos turbocharged and he became this guru on turbocharging and race engines. Ferrari hired him firstly to do a Ferrari 208 turbo and then to do F1 because F1 was changed and they had the flat 12 engine and in the early 80s it was not the engine to have and it was turbocharged it was coming in. Renault had proved this is going to be the way to go and also it allowed a much smaller engine. They were failing with all the aero when floor and aero was all coming important a flat 12 is very definitely not what you want so he in got involved with that project but Enzo Ferrari said after doing the 308 he says make me a 300 horsepower three liter engine he says I can do better than that I can do 400 horsepower he says go do it and that was this car that then went on to be F40 but it, I just love the simplicity and the, it's just beautiful under here and it's a, absolutely the way to do turbos they're all there in free air they're not cramped into a bulkhead and it's this engine that just makes this car it's also very clever how this car does all its venting and how this engine breathes you've got the intakes you see this rear window sort of dies down as a hidden sort of duct that goes into the engine compartment just blows air into the engine compartment and then the intakes that normally feed sort of air into the 308 intake into the carburetors or well, these big holes you see on the door and then going in they're actually onto the intercoolers so they're blowing underneath air to air intercoolers and then coming out hot air here the engine itself breathes through here these are the air intakes the air filters are down here coming out the, the top of the engine cover so they're the three vents feeding this amazing engine and it's 2.9 liter engine because of the group b it's you have to tie it by 1.4 is a four liter limit on them being turbocharged you have to bulk, you shrink the capacity there is also a boot up the front so there's no boot here but you, over the exhaust it's all up the front there's quite a lot of space in there but what this car is all about is the driving so let's take it outside now <laughs> the first thing that strikes you when you get in here it all feels quite tight it's quite a small cockpit in here and yeah seats very snug we'll come onto the seats in a moment 
and simplicity when I look at the dash. This sort of, I don't know what to describe it, it's sort of velvet cover on it, just an anti-reflection there. And dials, quite a few dials. If I look dead ahead, I've got a speedo and a rev counter. The rev counter, red line starts at 7,750 RPM, goes to 10. Speedo goes to 320 kilometers an hour. This car has also done 50,000 kilometers. So it's well, yeah, well used, shall we say, in the land of 288 GTO. Uh, and then oil pressure and a boost gauge. The last thing you ever look at is that boost gauge. When it's when it's boost, you're dead ahead and concentrating. Then in the middle, we have, well, water temperature, oil temperature, and fuel. And then there's some extras on this car that were available at, in, you know, when you purchased this in 1985, this car. Air conditioning was an option, as was the radio. Weirdly, Ferrari gave you the speakers with Ferrari GTO written on them. That was, um, you got that, but you just didn't get a radio to power it. I think there's a, and the aerial is sort of in the actual glass, I think I can see. Uh, yeah, other extras were, um, oh yeah, electric windows fitted to this one. And I think you can get a slightly different trim. You can get um, bicolor sort of seats and things like that. But all um, Toyota GTO were red, bar one. Sort of Brunei had a black car. I think it was even right-hand drive. Uh, and it's just the simplicity. You've got to remember this car was based on the 308. So it was the sort of the base car in Ferrari's range. It was the small, the junior, the entry Ferrari. And therefore, it's it's quite sort of plain in here. Carpets on the floor. I love the central console and how it's minimalist it is. And with switch gear, it went a bit weird when you got to three two eight, and they had sort of pl funny plastic buttons and not as stylish. This is a classic Ferrari look, and also with the gated gear change, of course. The other strange thing with this car is you've got dual controls for the climate. I've got left and right climate controls, so I can have individual heat and individual fans for left and right, which is just weird. Hap, and then hazards and rear fog. And what I need now is the key, which I've forgotten. So bear with me and I'll go and get a key. There is the key. Um, simplistic keys in those days. Door, little uh, door key, no central locking on your 288 GTO, and that's how you start it. I should actually say, when I said in the garage that it doesn't say 288 GTO anywhere on it, it does on the steering column there. I wasn't aware of that. There we are. Right. Turn key. Oh, I've put the steering. Turn key, ignite, and this rubber button brings everything to life. We are. And oops, the other thing I should mention, just as my elbow hits it, the engine, it's there. It's so in the cabin, it's unbelievable how much of it comes into here and being a small car. Conventional handbrake into first. It's all a bit stiff at the moment because uh, there's no temperature in this car. And away you go. Range, the buzzing. Yeah, so I'm going to get some temperature into this car, and you'll be joining me on some better roads in a moment. First thing that strikes you when you get in well, visibility out. And in particular, if you've just stepped out of an F40, because I can see out the back window. Yeah, the, the, if you're trying to look out the back of an F40, it's all hopeless with sort of like those sort of vents and the Lexan glass. But this just feels normal. Big windows all around, obviously, because it's 308 based. It's way more civilized than you expect it to be. Then, so quite a stiff gear change. It's slightly reluctant to change in gears, but you've got to remember the gearbox is behind the engine. There's quite a linkage between this and that. But it's the performance if we just squirt it up the hill. Yeah. Yeah, you can't press the loud pedal very long 
once boost builds, off you go. But what's nice is the throttle action. It's not as crazy wild as you would imagine. If I bring it down the gears again, into second, build the revs. You can just bleed how much boost you actually want on and off throttle. It's incredibly linear. It's a beautiful feeling how you can get the boost to build and then just ease it off and then go again. But boy, is it quick. Slow things up again. The key to this car, I think, is just how light it is. Ferrari say, I think it's 1150 kilos. I'll put it up there now. Um, dry weight and that is super light I actually weighed this car and I was surprised it went 1260 kilos but then I looked and the fuel tank is enormous on this car it's something like 120 litres so <laughs> mad so there's a hundred and some kilos there it's also got air conditioning it's got radio it's got electric windows and they would all add weight but a stripped out 288 GTO is fair, and it's a fair bit lighter, about 100 kilos lighter than an F40. So yeah, lightness is what the other thing you notice about this car, and you feel it everywhere, steering, ride, everything. The other thing, driving position isn't too bad really. Um, it's a nice position to the wheel, it's not adjust the wheel, but I don't feel like I'm a, a crazy Italian ape in this car. So again, it feels friendly. But what's it going to feel like down here, I wonder? Oh. Oh. Look at the amount of information coming through the wheel. It is very definitely an old school supers car, this one. Oh. It's not get deflected by the bumps but I'm feeling everything under this, uh, what's on, happening on the tarmac through the wheels. It's just information overload. And then a little, so just a little boost and off we go. Boost builds later than you think as well. I'll come to that on a better bit of road, but yeah. All these bumps, that's a vicious bump here. That's why I use this road. Completely absorbed, no thought it's gonna touch anything. So that's the other thing about the 288 GTO. It's weirdly very usable. Now that boost, if I just slow things down again. Right, I'm in third. And I'm at... 2000 rpm. If I give it full bore boost builds, three, yeah, three and a half thousand you need before the boost charges on, and then at four it's all there and you're flying. So, and then you've got to remember you've got from 4000 to over 7000 power band, so it's in the meat for a lot, and it's not nearly as spiky as the F40. Sound. It's sort of, oh, it's a racer at heart. So you can just tell. Yeah, you have to learn to behave in this car. You can just go so quick, and it's because of that ride. You're not intimidated. The road isn't to be feared. Whatever it's like. So a B road like this, no issue. It doesn't need a ro racetrack to shine. The 288 GTO. So, yeah, a quick summary of likes and dislikes. Ah, where do we start? Well, the dislike, unfortunately, are oh, the seats. Oh, it was gutted. I did about 400 miles in this car, and I really wanted to get to know it. Went into Wales, wonderful day. But by the end of it, they are, my hips were just killing me, and I ended up having to sit crooked like this. They're super tight, they're tiny. They're like a, trying to sit in a, kids seat sort of in the back of something it's really tight on your hips and also on the ribs I find and the owner finds it as well so what I asked him and it's sort of notorious they are super tight on the seat then 
gear change isn't quite as good as you want it to be, especially when you're coming from fourth to third, it's slightly vague, even though it's this gated thing, the spring in's a bit weak perhaps. <sighs> Price, this is a three, three and a half million pound car now. <laughs> a long time ago when I could have picked one of these up for 170 or something like that. And the other weirdness with the 28 GTO, it was 73,000 new when it was launched in 1985. For reference, my Countach was about 70 in 1987. But when the F40 rocked up, that was 193,000. It was almost three times the price of the 288 GTO. Ferrari learnt their lesson. They said, yeah, we'll make some money here. But, oh. <laughs> so I just, just a touch on the, the terrain and off you go. It, again, it's that lightness. Oh, but the lights. Oh, well, I'm going to do my favourite corner first and I'll go through some lights. Good brakes. Not at all an issue of the brakes. Lovely feel. Nothing like F40 heavy pedal. Just utterly normal. Just under the trees, a bit damp there. And punch out. Whoa. Well, there you go. Just handling friendliness. This is a, is a crazy Ferrari, even though its reputation is turbocharged engine. You get to know it. It doesn't bite as hard as F40 when it all lights up. And you'll get to really like this car. Uh, what else looks? God, it's drop dead gorgeous to look at, isn't it? And these sort of mirrors up on flagposts just set it out apart. They do actually slightly block, and interestingly, there's no adjustment on them. You have to do them manually, there's no electric adjust. But yeah, wonderful, wonderful car, deserves its reputation. It's for, as a Ferrari for the Contessenti, really. You need to know your Ferrari to know how special the 288 GTO is. And do I regret not buying one when I got the Zonda? Do you know, after this time with it, no, because I bought that Zonda and that gave me the keys to Pagani and that glorious innocent period when Zonda sort of took off. I owned a Zonda and it was like being part of this amazing family. So I don't regret the Zonda for a moment. Which one would I like in the garage now from Zonda to, to a GTO? I want the 288 GTO. <laughs> But at three, three and a half million, it's out of reach. But my goodness, I am so grateful to the owner of this car to be able to experience it and to really use it, really get to know it, spend two weeks with it, drive it in the rain, drive it in the dark, drive it just for the pleasure. How great is that? 288 GTO, one of my favorite, favorite cars. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming along very soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm.